Okay, so your program promised you an open source love story in 3X, and so like every good 3-act uh, play, we open with the Dramatis Personae. So first, this is Peppercorn. Peppercorn is one of your user's dogs, and like any good dog owner, the first thing they did upon acquiring Peppercorn was go and change their password on all of their software services to Peppercorn. <laughs> this is Mallory. Mallory is an attacker. We will come back to Mallory more later. And this is me. My name is TJ Shook. I am on the internet everywhere as TJ Shook with the dots and spaces removed from my name, GitHub, Twitter, also Instagram and Yo like Tenderlove. So if you want to Yo me as well, you can. Um, I work at Harvest. Uh, I'm a developer there. We are the makers of the world's best time tracking software. If you do anything where you charge money for your time, uh, agency, freelancer, consultant, you owe it to yourself to check it out. Um, notably for this talk, I am not a security expert. Um, there are people who are real security experts who get paid lots of money to know about a lot more stuff than I do. But by virtue of having users, I have to be a security expert, and so do all of you. Um, ignorance is not an excuse here. If there is a security breach in your system, you can't just say, we didn't know any better. That is insufficient. And you'll see later there's a lot of interconnectedness here that your breach can have further reaching implications. So though I am not a security expert, um, I have to be, as do you. So back to Mallory. Let's talk about her attack. So good security is about layers. You should have all sorts of different kinds of security. You should have application level security. You should protect against SQL injection, XSF, CSRF. Rails gives you a lot of that kind of by default. You should also have infrastructure level security. You should have a secure data center. You should have physical firewalls between your devices. However, to truly investigate any particular level of the layer cake that is security, we have to assume everything else has failed. So we have to assume that this works. Mallory can just run her script and get a raw dump of your database. Um, so let's, considering what we are going to do with our users' passwords, what's the easiest option for what we can do? We can store them as plain text. It's easy, it makes sense. When someone just logs in, they pass their password, we check it, if it matches, great. This is obviously bad. And no one here is doing this, correct? Right? Does anyone want to admit to doing it? All right. Someone is doing it. Someone is not raising their hand, but someone's doing it because it doesn't matter. They have a site that's just like, you know, GIF ranking, and you know, you say like, I like this anime GIF more than this one. It doesn't matter. If their passwords leak, someone's just going to rank a bunch of GIFs on their behalf. But this is bad because users reuse passwords. So if they break into your site and steal a bunch of passwords, they don't necessarily care about your site, but now they have a big long list of usernames and passwords that they're going to go to Gmail and try, and Facebook and try and all the banking sites and try, and they're going to get into some of them. And if they get into some of them, they now have additional vectors of attack to get into more of them. So it's important, again, to remember that you are part of a greater world, and you cannot be the weakest link in the chain, because again, ignorance is not an excuse for not knowing this. So we know this is bad. So we need some way to obfuscate the dump so that when Mallory gets it, she cannot use it. So the easiest thing is just encrypt it. This is a very secure form of encryption known as uh, ROT13, ROT13, a Caesar cipher with a key of 13. You take all the letters and you shift them by 13. So an A becomes an N, a B becomes an O, a C becomes a P. Um, that's just for il uh, illustrative purposes. This could be DES3, AES256, any kind of real encryption. But the key to all of this is that there's a key. There's a way to reverse it. So here the key is 13. If you know 13, you can take all these passwords and reverse them back out again. So somewhere there has to be this secret. It's either in your app code, or it's on the server, or any number of places. But it's important to remember that since the attacker has already gotten through most of your defenses, they presumably also have access to that secret in some way. And it's also important to remember that an attacker could be a malicious employee um, who has easy access to your application code or your server. And they don't even have to be the only attacker. Like if there is a public leak and you work at somewhere big, like there was a big leak for LinkedIn passwords, all it takes is one malicious employee to kind of like leak out the encryption key and then all of those passwords are broken. So it's important to note that encryption is reversible. So the data is obfuscated, but if you have the secret, you can decrypt it and read it. Hashing is irreversible. So if you have peppercorn and you apply a hash function to it, you get some output. And if you have secret one, two, three, four, and you apply some hash function to it, you get some output. But if you have some output, you don't know what the input is, because hashing is irreversible. There is no inverse function to give you the input. 
Additionally, hashing is deterministic. This becomes useful for authentication because when you hash peppercorn, you get an output. When you hash peppercorn a second time, you get the same output. When you hash it the third time, you get the same output. That's how you can actually do authentication. When the password comes in, you hash it. If the hashes match, you know that the input was the same, but you can't back out because it's irreversible. It's also important that it's deterministic but not obvious. So peppercorn hash the same time as the same output, but if you trivially change the input, say you capitalize peppercorn, the output is completely different. And if you have output that's just trivially different, so here the least significant bit is off by one, you have no way of telling what the input is. So this is great. All of our problems are solved. We just hash all of our passwords, and now anyone with a dump can't reverse them back to get plain text passwords. Um, throughout all of this, I'm using MD5 just because it's shorter, so it fits on slides better, but SHA-1 is effectively the same. So we can't go password, uh, backwards. All of our passwords are safe. However, we have a problem in that hashing is deterministic. This is a double-edged sword. Because the hash of peppercorn is always the same, the hash of peppercorn is always the same. And this leads to the concept of rainbow tables. Uh, a couple of logistical points here. First of all, that's the best slide that's ever been made. <laughs> Second, I have already turned it into a gift for you. I will tweet it out later. <laughs> Third, we're not actually going to be talking about rainbow tables. We are technically going to be talking about lookup tables, which are kind of a generalization. They're the first step of rainbow tables. Rainbow tables are a little bit more complicated. The understanding of them that you're going to get, though, is effectively the same. Um, they have the same consequences and the same ways to mitigate them. And if I was talking about lookup tables, my slide would look like this, and that's boring, so instead you get this one. But remember, we're talking about lookup tables here. OK. so. We have this dump, Mallory has this dump, and she wants to work backwards from a table to see what the original value was. So as a proof of concept, we can use the world's best lookup table, which is Google. If you just drop in the hash and Google it, we don't even have to leave the results page. You can see that that MD5 is for peppercorn. So Mallory, in a better tool than just using Google, can figure this out. So we need some way to render all of these pre-computed tables obsolete so that you can't just Google a hash and see what it is. The easiest way is to just change all the inputs. So we know that the hash of peppercorn is this, but if we just append a string of nonsense to it, we get a different hash. And in our app's password hashing method, we just say, okay, here's our like, app-wide string of nonsense. You append it all the time, and you can see, you check our label, uh, lookup table, and there's nothing there. So we did it. We totally defeated it. We did it, um, except we didn't. So a, an attacker cannot just look up the password now in a pre-computed table but they can generate a new table trivially because it's not that hard to generate these hashes. On this MacBook Air, which is never considered to be like the fastest computer on Earth, I can calculate 13 million SHA-1s every second. 13 million a second on a MacBook Air. So if you have that altering scheme from the app code or from the server, again, it's a secret that's built into your thing, someone can just use that to attack by doing the same method. This is where Harvest was. So as a proof of concept, I decided to white hat attack our database. I had put down a dump. Um, I did my best to anonymize all this data, so I only worked on the raw hashes. Uh, you can use any freely available program. Going through and Googling each individual hash will take a long time. There is one called Hashcat that you can download, Google it, it's not hard. You can use John the Ripper, which you can install via Mac uh, Homebrew. It is not that hard to do this. You also need a word list. I Googled for about 10 minutes, and I found a 25 million long dictionary. And I ran it through Hashcat, and as I was considering whether I should make a cup of coffee, 87 seconds later, there was Peppercorn, along with 80,000 other passwords. 80,000 passwords in under a minute and a half. Now, this isn't even a majority of our users, but it's enough to do significant damage. I can now go and attack everything again can't. I know these passwords, but I don't know whose they are. I don't know your password. Um, additionally, in this list of what you would think are insecure passwords were also these that a lot of people at first blush might think are secure. So the first one, that universe, um, it looks secure because it's that sort of leet speak alternate swapping. But these word lists are really good, and they have a lot of those. And the programs are really good and can do a lot of these automatically. So even if your word list only has the word universe, it knows to swap things out. The second one looks really good until you look at a QWERTY keyboard, and you realize it's just effectively a hardware hack where you're just tracing keys on a keyboard. Again, they're smart enough to know that. The last one, I have no idea. 
I don't even know what that is. I can't figure out why it's in there. It's probably just in there because of length. It's not that long. But again, they're good. These passwords are easily cracked. And as a user, you should be using some kind of randomly generated long passwords, but that's a different talk. So our last attempt was close but it was using a global salt where we were just appending known nonsense. So we can do a per password salt. So now instead of doing just peppercorn with the global nonsense, we can on every individual user give them a different one. This now gives all of our users those strong passwords. Everyone now has very long, very randomly generated passwords effectively. We just store them in the database next to the thing. Knowing the salt doesn't particularly help the attacker, but now the computational complexity is greater because they have to compute a table for every individual user. I got rid of the email column for space here, by the way. You would normally also have that. Um, if you have a very random salt as well with particular length, you could get enough entropy so that people with repeated passwords, so if you have a thousand users with the password password, uh, they also have different hashes. So this is pretty good. This gets us pretty far. But this is pretty good for 1976. This is approximately what Unix's Crypt 3 does in 1976. And at the time, uh, modern hardware could calculate about four per second. So there was enough kind of difficulty to keep someone from generating a million lookup tables for all these users. But today we have these. This is an AMD AX7990. It costs about a thousand bucks, so anyone can reasonably buy one of these. This can calculate 1.5 billion hashes per second. So my MacBook Air, 13 million, this 1.5 billion. It makes generating these one lookup table per user uh, calculations feasible again. And the problem is all of these hashing algorithms that we've been talking about, SHA-1, uh, MD5, they're not made for password hashing. They're made for things like checking vial validity on both ends of a network transfer. And they're designed because of that to be fast. So because they're designed to be fast, hardware keeps getting faster and they keep getting computed faster. And now we have a problem. So in 1999, uh, Niels Provost and David Mazzieris published a paper about a future adaptable password scheme where they were trying to solve this exact same problem. And they came up with Bcrypt. Now, Bcrypt has all the goodies we've already discussed. It's a one-way hash, pre-image resistant, it's deterministic, it has built-in salt, so you don't even have to worry about doing them anymore. But it has two additional goodies that are the actual notable ones that we're going to talk about a little bit more. One is that the underlying cipher is XBlowfish. It's based on Blowfish, which is notably expensive. It's known for taking a long time to boot up. Uh, but it has a new set of algorithms to be even more expensive. So the EKS stands for Expensive Key Schedule. So it requires more memory, which uh, makes GPUs and other specialized hardware uh, less feasible in an attack. But more interesting is the notion of an adaptive cost. That was right in the title of the paper. That's how important it is. So let's look at the dump again. So we have a dump with all of these uh, Bcrypt digests in it. Bcrypt Digest looks approximately like that. So let's investigate its anatomy. First of all, ignore the dollar signs. They are just delimiters. They don't really signify anything. At the end here, we have the actual output of the hash. That is the checksum. That is the hash. It's 192 bits uh, encoded into Base64. Um, to the left of it is the salt. It's 128-bit salt that, again, you don't have to worry about. It's just taken care of by the Bcrypt algorithm. It's, again, Base64 encoded to be a little shorter. On the left here, that means this is Bcrypt. Um, a value of 2, 2a, 2b, 2x, and 2y all signify Bcrypt for assorted historical reasons. Um, we can go over those later. But generally, you'll see 2a because that's what Bcrypt Ruby uses. Um, but this is the most interesting one. This is that notion of cost. So let's see what that means. When you want to Bcrypt a password, you pass in additionally this cost parameter that gives you an output. If you do it a second time, you get a different output, but that's because of salting. We already know that. And if you do it a third time with a higher cost, you get a different output yet again, but there you see that the cost is different. This isn't particularly notable until you look at the time that it takes to do each of these. So the first one took about 0.06 seconds, second one the same. The third one took just over one second. And that's where that adaptable cost is. As hardware uh, gets faster over time, we can march that cost forward along with it to get more expensive calculations. These are all approximate averages using my laptop right here. So a cost of 9 takes about 0.03 seconds to calculate one of these hashes, and a cost of 16 takes about 4 seconds. Right now, today, you probably don't want to do that last one because you don't want to add 4 seconds to your login flow, but somewhere in like the 12 to 13 range is probably uh, something that wouldn't be noticed by your users, but would definitely be noticed by an attacker. 
using a cost of 12 in Harvest, uh, that previous attack that took 87 seconds would now take about 84,000 years. So we've now kind of gotten over that hump of the cost calculation where it's no longer worth it. Um, so bcrypt is kind of that sweet spot. It has a Ruby library. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, which makes it very easy to use. Um, and it gives us kind of this future proofing. Some people right now who skipped ahead in class are saying, well, why don't you just use pbkdf2, or why don't you use script, or something else? And that's fine. You're, again, you're ahead of the game. Those are okay. Those are probably fine. <laughs> uh, I disagree with you. We can talk about the finer points later. But if you are already using pbkdf2 or script, you can stick with it. Um, it's if you're using a, an older algorithm like SHA-1 or MD5 that you'll want to change. So how can we fix this problem if we have it currently? We need the plain text version of the password because if we have hashes, we already learned they're irreversible. So if you already have the plain text, if you're in that step one, this is easy. Just run some kind of one shot to go through them all and convert them all. Easy. Otherwise, we need the plain text password. And the only way we get this is in our current authentication method. So currently, we have something that looks like this, authenticate with the plain text password that we used to hash and then match. We want to get to here, where we're using bcrypt to check them. Uh, the astute members of the audience will notice the double equals there and uh, get immediately concerned because I told them that bcrypt is irreversible and we're comparing this plain text string against what appears to be the reversed bcrypt digest. This is actually because bcrypt Ruby overloads the equal equals operator. And uh, I think this is one of the worst design decisions of bcrypt Ruby, and I intend to reverse it eventually. Uh, I've actually, we just got an issue on bcrypt Ruby like two weeks ago that someone was confused about this, but just know that that's being overloaded and it's actually not just doing a string comparison. Um, so the easiest way to do this is just hook into our auth filter with, or with a pre-filter. So you get the plain text password and you run it through this conversion and then you check it because it's been converted. And the conversion's easy too. bcrypt provides a way to check, is this already a valid bcrypt hash? If it is, just kick back because we're already good. Otherwise, take it, convert it. Easy as pie. Uh, this code works because this is exactly what we used in Harvest. We dumped this in, and over the course of a couple of weeks, this is two and a half weeks of natural conversion of our users. This is the number of users who had bcrypt passwords. So there's the immediate big spike up front as daily users and like all the API hits came in, and then it slowly tapers off as we catch more and more. Um, we needed some way to get the rest, and because I had already white hat attacked the database, I just did it a second time, but this time with conversion in mind, and we got a big spike that took us the rest of the way. Um, <laughs> there were a couple remaining ones that didn't get caught in this. They had both strong passwords and they didn't log in recently. Those we just reset and sent them an email and let them know it was up, and it wasn't that many users and it wasn't that difficult. So if you have this problem, it's not that hard to fix. You can do it. There is one downside to bcrypt, and that is that it is, a, and it is an expensive algorithm, but because of that, it's an expensive algorithm. You will see more load on your servers. This is the CPU across all of our servers. You can see it approximately doubled after we launched bcrypt. However, it's still within the realm of tolerability. Um, we also probably have a higher level because we still support basic authentication through our API, which gets used a lot, and every single one of those carries a username and password, which will do another bcrypt hit. If you are already whole hog on OAuth and only support OAuth, you won't see as big of a hit. But again, it's totally worth it. So Act 1 was the easy part. You can learn that on Wikipedia. Act 2 is where we add conflict in a three-act play. So. This is about fat binary gems. We talked about bcrypt Ruby. bcrypt Ruby is the Ruby gem that is for bcrypt. I wanted to add a feature to this. It was missing something that I thought would be convenient. But the test didn't run, and the dependencies were out of date, and there were docs missing. So that one pull request turned into a dozen pull requests. And after they were all merged, uh, you can get commit bit by persistence. And so after enough annoyance, uh, Amon asked, can I get commit bit? And then suddenly, I was the maintainer of bcrypt Ruby. Um, there have been a couple of de facto maintainers before me, most of whom no longer do it. Um, this is what bcrypt Ruby looks like, the source of bcrypt Ruby. But more accurately, this is what it looks like. It's just a Ruby gem that's a wrapper around C and Java extensions. So when you distribute a gem of it as a convenience to your users so that they don't have to have a compiler on their system, you can provide uh, compiled binaries. But you can see that every version has four different versions. One is the compiled Java version. One is the compiled like Nix-like version. The top two are Windows versions, uh, one for x64 and one for 32-bit. Uh, um, 
the problem is that for Windows, you need to have what are called these fat binaries that provide support for Windows 1.8, 1.9, in one wrapped up thing. Uh, I'm not a Windows developer, so I had no good way to do this. Luckily, when Amon added this to Beaker Ruby, he left these long commit notes about how to do this. But he left these three years ago, and like anything about computers written on the internet that's three years old, it doesn't work. Five years ago, Aaron introduced the notion of fat binary gems, um, where I found out that he made the same queen joke as me five years before me. Um, but additionally, like anything written about computers on the internet that's five years old, it definitely doesn't work. All of this is ultimately, though, just wrapping up rate compiler, which is this great gem that abstracts a lot of this away. So I followed through all the docs, of which there are many, it is very lengthy, and none of it worked. <laughs> so the Rails team has this Rails dev box that they use to keep you from having to, on your development machine, have all the dependencies that you need to run the Rails tests. You can see what's in the box, all these dependencies. So I had a dream that was inspired by this, where I wanted to make a rate compiler dev box that had all the Rubies you needed, GCC, the JDK, uh, MinGW, which is the uh, library that allows Nix-like machines to compile Windows binaries. And I thought, man, this will be great. We can all have these fat binary gems forever. And Vagrant uh, kind of offered that solution, right? What it says on the tin, create and configure lightweight, reproducible, and portable development environments. Exactly what I wanted. And it didn't work. So what do you do with anything that doesn't work? You put it on GitHub. And with that, I opened up rate compiler issue number 79. In our three-act play, this would be the climax. This is our turning point. You were promised a love story. <laughs> this is Luis Lavena. Luis is the developer of the one-click Ruby installer for Windows. Uh, as part of that work, he became a member of the Ruby core team. As part of the work of both of those, he was voted a Ruby hero in 2010. But important for this talk, he is the developer of Rake Compiler. So when I opened that uh, Rake Compiler issue, I said, listen, I did everything I can. I followed all the docs. I just can't get this to work. And then Luis opened up Rake Compiler dev box number two which was his pull request to attempt to help me through this trying, trying time. And on this epic thread, he dropped triple hearts on me, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. So I need all of you to take out your assorted internet devices, phones, computers, and help me pay him back. So everyone tweet at Luis right now, three hearts. Thank him for being a wonderful uh, maintainer and OSS collaborator. Uh, pro tip, if you have a Mac that's running Mavericks or later, you can hit uh, control command space and get access to the real emoji. Um, so Luis, help me through this. And to half of you, I want to kind of implore you to find your Luis and thank them for the work they do. It could be a maintainer of something you use. It could be a coworker or whatever. But more important than just thinking, because that's easy, collaborate with them. You'd be surprised how willing they are to accept this collaboration, and it can be very worthwhile. Additionally, Luis lives in uh, Argentina and Paris, so it was a nice little fun global collaboration, too. To the other half of you, the half that are already maintaining assorted things and you know, are the, the Luises already out there, I want you to be the Luis you wish to see in the world. So next time you know, someone comes to you with that issue that you've seen a 1,000 times already or has a question that you think they should have just posted a Stack Overflow or, God forbid, it's a stupid question, before you say RTFM, remember that the problem might be the FM and you know, do your best to help them through it uh, and the world will be better for it. So what have we learned? Number one, just use bcrypt. Just do it. It's easy. It's not that hard. Uh, talk to me afterwards. If you want to go through this, we'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll hug, we'll convert our passwords. Number two, distribute a dev box. If you have anything that has complicated external dependencies, other people will be much more likely to uh, collaborate with you and submit pull requests and help you uh, go forward with it if you make it easy for them. Uh, also, if you have something that has external dependencies, you should try rate compiler dev box. It will help you cross-compile your gems without pulling your hair out. But most importantly, I want to encourage you to release, collaborate, and iterate. Thank you. <laughs>